Oh, hi, Linda. <laughs> um, I uh, hope everybody can hear me just fine, and I won't be yelling too loud. Uh, welcome, and uh, it's nice to see a big crowd out there. Uh, any first-time visitors that would like to introduce themselves and maybe tell us who they're searching? or Yes, sir. Oh, I'm you. Oh, good. Uh, Joe Solvay's the name. I'm from Sarnia all my life. I lived around the corner. Oh, well. Well, great. I'm glad you joined us. Yeah. And, and who are you researching? So or are you? So Just your family? <laughs> oh, well, getting lost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just a couple weeks ago. Oh, oh very good. Very good. Well, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Trying to find people is uh, Perfect. more difficult than I thought. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good hobby, though. It'll keep you busy. <laughs> oh, I've got lots of time. Good. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. I'm Pat. Okay. I'm, uh, my second meeting here. Yeah. Uh, I uh, <coughs> like to research my mother's father. Oh, okay. Uh, he had two children before my mother came along, and after my mother was born, he booked. Uh, he uh, met my mother in England, or my mother's mother in England during the First World War. He was a Canadian citizen up from Antoon Island. Oh. I believe he was a native, maybe even. Possible. Um, so, you know, just, just... Yeah, see what you can find out. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm doing some research right now for the Johnson family. <laughs> I guess she told you, didn't she? Uh, I have a man in Sweden who wants me to find living realms for the Johnson family. So if there's anyone who has any contact with Johnson, so that, that's, come, and, come and talk to you. So these were all in Sarnia that I know of. Johnson or Johnson? No, John's son. John's son. So, no tea. No tea. I've, I've, I think I think the latest generation has migrated to Corona, and that's where I've stopped. Hmm. Very good. Well, it's uh, not likely a real easy name to search because there's it's almost close to Smith. <laughs> this is living relatives. Oh, okay. Okay. Very good. Well, good luck with that, Eric. Anybody else? Okay, well, we shall continue then. Uh, we have just a couple of uh, correspondence or announcements here. Um, the skits viewing and time capsule opening is, of course, April 28. I'm sure you've all seen it in the paper anyway. But, and Kent Branch of the OGS is having a half-day workshop on DNA. Uh, it's $25, and it's 11 o'clock, and I didn't write the date down. But it's back on the table there if you're interested. And uh, we must not forget our OGS conference coming up on the 1st to the 3rd of June. And I just found in a paper yesterday this little note that says the British home children. Um, there's a presentation with Don Oatman uh, of the British Home Children Advocacy and Research Association. And it's Wednesday the 18th at 6.30 at the Mall Road Library. So if anybody's interested in that. And I think that's it for now. So I would ask Sandra Carlton to come up and introduce our speaker. I'll get out of your way here, Sandra. Thank you much. Thanks, Noreen. I have a pleasure. It's a great pleasure to introduce Lynn Valinga. Today, Lynn is a mom of three and came to Sarnia 27 years ago from the Halton Hills area. She's the client services advisor and has been employed with at uh, Lakeview Cemetery as that position in crematorium for 12 and a half years and is one of the first people families meet when entering the office. She offers advice and guidance to customers <coughs> seeking the various services of Lakeview. Lynn says she's a bit of a history buff and that that sparked her interest in identifying some of the famous incumbent clients at, of Lakeview. When she was a scout leader, she would take the kids out on a tour of the cemetery and identify many of the known and unknown famous people who were resting there. 
Tonight she's going to share that information with us. Please join me in welcoming Lynn Valinga. Wow, a uh, bigger group than uh, I was anticipating. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, this will be fun, I hope. Um, I'm new at this, never done public speaking. This wasn't even on my bucket list, so <clears throat> <clears throat> bear with me, okay? There might be a whole lot of ums and ahs. Um, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> History. Um, first of all, what you people do, I think, is absolutely wonderful, okay? Um, we need to keep it going, and we need to encourage it. Um, what I do, unfortunately, is not that. Um, it is to a point, but not so much. So um, we do have a walking tour of the cemetery uh, for the more famous, I guess, if you want to say, um, people that are there. Uh, of course, Alexander McKenzie, who is in our tour. Uh, so basically what I've done is I've put our tour onto a slideshow. Okay, so a lot of you I know um, have done research on these people because the research that I did had your names all over it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> so, so moving on, um, again, I'm not even sure why I'm here, but thank you very much for asking me, because this is uh, <clears throat> an experience. Okay, so, uh, slide two, please. Say okay, and I'll get Okay. <laughs> okay, so Lakeview Cemetery was established in 1879. We have um, the original interment records of, of the 1879 beginnings. Um, people are amazed when I bring the books out, and it's a great big huge thing that is outweighing me these days. Um, and when I bring it out, and people have a, an idea of the age of it by the writing in it and that sort of thing. So it, it is kind of fun if you get a chance. We're not switching for some reason. We're not switching. <laughs> Should we have done the should we have done the other one? No, just give us that. Yes. But you can talk about the slides. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so while we're going on to slide four, if we can, <clears throat> before we get there, um, what I would like to mention, and I was going to do it at the end, but I'll do it now, is when you're coming into the cemetery to ask for information, when you're looking for someone. First of all, we do have a website that does have a search engine on it. So if you have that um, at home, that ability at home, then by all means. Um, it's in the top right-hand corner of the screen, and it says database search. And it's very simple. You punch in a name, hit search, and you'll get a list of that name. It gives you the year they were deceased and the location they are. Okay? The one thing we don't have on our website as of yet are maps of the cemetery. We're on slide two. We're on slide two. Can we skip to four? <laughs> We're just going right along here. Well, that's three. Okay, so we should be on Mr. Goodison. Okay, good stuff. So, he was born actually in Strathroy in 1876. Uh, was the president of the uh, John Goodison Thresher Company, which actually was his father's, uh, was the director of the Ontario Commercial Travels Association. Why they would even have that back then is beyond me. But like most of the people on the tour, there he's a politician. I'm amazed at how many politicians 
came out of Sarnia Lambton. I mean, are you all politicians? <laughs> Seriously. Um, he was first elected to Parliament in 1925, and in 1928, unfortunately, had surgery in Ohio, and 10 days later, he passed away. Okay? So the next slide we have is um, Malcolm Cameron, and he is actually one of the founding fathers. Uh, by record, there were three founding fathers of the Sarnia area. So in 1828, he was considered uh, a fairly large merchant in the area. Um, 1835, he opened the general store in what was then known as Port Sarnia. 1836, he was elected, again, a politician. Um, he was the, elected to the 13th Parliament of Upper Canada. 1837, he bought 200 acres from the Crown for, four, for 400 pounds. Um, and that's actually what um, began Sarnia. So uh, he's known actually for the streets of Cameron, Lock Hill, Euthemia, Christina, Wellington, and Cromwell. And they were all named after either members of his family or gentlemen that he aspired to. And that would be Wellington and uh, Cromwell. Okay? Excuse me. Yes. Um, the founder city of Sarnia. Mm -hmm. um, before Sarnia, there was Port Sarnia, mm -hmm. and then before that, there was the Rapids, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, when when, when the, the, the city becomes Sarnia, do you know? Um, honestly, I don't. 1814? No. 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, that sounds, 19, 14, yeah. yes, that sounds correct. Yeah, I did read that, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We are on, yes, okay. I can see it on your screen. <laughs> okay, so um, people are more familiar with um, uh, Maud Hanna, actually, than they are William. William was born in 1862. He was a teacher and a lawyer. He was named King's Council, Council and Director of Imperial Oil. Director of other companies, including the Imperial Bank of Canada. Uh, Maud actually was his second wife, um, and following the death of William, she contributed $10,000, which was half of the monies to the city for the purpose of the land for Canaterra Park. Along with many others, uh, with, with many other contributions. Uh, she died in 1946, shortly after uh, Hannah Memorial School was uh, opened. Okay. Now, this lady, Sadie Knowles, was known as the story lady. For decades, four of them, as a matter of fact, she would volunteer um, down at the library and in different schools reading to children. What a lot of people don't realize is how instrumental she was in our cities, or our, not our cities, but our, um, our county's art collection. Okay, uh, she actually was one of the founding members of the Women's Conservation Committee in 1914. What they used to do is they used to gather up rags and used paper, and they would sell it to recyclers. That money they would then give to, at that point, because of the wars, they would give it to the Red Cross. So, the, uh, by the end of the wars, they had actually contributed $4,800, which at that time, of course, was a huge amount of money. So, 10 of the people, and when it was going good, there was probably 30 or 40 women and about 10 to 12 men 
that would do this collecting. And they would do it all by horseback and horse, horse and buggy and, and that sort of thing at, you know, at, at that point. Um, they actually continued collecting monies the same way and started buying pieces of art. One piece that they bought was actually uh, from, hmm, let me see if I can get it here. Um, it was actually a piece from, I believe it was uh, Thompson, and they paid $600 for it. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, he being one of the group of seven. The uh, value of the art that is now showing at the Judith and Norman uh, Art Gallery back in 2007 that was purchased with this monies was totaling about 14 million. So, yes, she was quite... <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes? Okay. Um, I, I just knew her as Miss Noel, so was she never married? No. I don't believe so, no. I, it, well, I've noticed that actually quite often in, in doing history. I believe in some cases, in this case I don't know if it's true or not, but in some cases it's actually the mother's maiden name. Mm -hmm. uh, are we on to the next one? Okay. So uh, this gentleman uh, was actually born in Scotland in 1809. And... His known to fame is that he was the first publisher of the Sarnia Observer. Uh, and if it's... Yeah, that... It, unfortunately, it's a terrible picture of him. Um, and be, being the publisher, you'd think I'd be able to find all kinds of them, but I really couldn't. That was the only one I could find, so I thought that was kind of odd. Uh, he was also named in 1865, he was named um, County Warden. In 1891, he died at a very good age of 83. So the next slide. <clears throat> the next slide actually is, um, it's for the first and second sheriff of the Sarnia Lambton area. Uh, he, he was born, uh, James was born, James Sr. was born in 1806 in England, coming to Canada in 1820. Um, it was actually Malcolm Cameron who persuaded him to move to the Sarnia area from Perth. In 1845, he built a stone, uh, sorry, a uh, flour mill Shortly after, sold it to Mr. Cameron and remained manager, also managing the Lambton Loan Company. In 1853, he became the first sheriff. And that was until 1872 when his health began to fail him. And then his son took over. And his son, of course, born in 1842, educated in Sarnia uh, to uh, law, uh, three years under uh, Honorable T.B., uh, actually it was Timothy, um, Parody, uh, then succeeded as second sheriff. Is anybody bored yet? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Captain Richard Vidal, we all know Vidal Street, <laughs> how he actually got that named after him. He was a captain in the Royal Navy, was rewarded for his service with 200 acres that became the city's residential neighborhood of choice. Uh, he was regarded. He was regarded as one of the three founding fathers as well. Half a century of the city's. Uh, he was half the. How do I, let me try that again. <laughs> he was involved with half a century of the city's politics and business. 
accredited with naming Richard Street, Emmerich, uh, which is now part of Brock, and of course, Vital. He was, <coughs> I'm sorry? Yes, yes. Uh, I was just about to say, not to be undone by his wife, Charlotte, <laughs> instrumental in, in naming Charlotte Street, Penrose, and Mitten, Essex after uncle, uh, after an uncle, and Maria after a daughter. So he is also the sole donor of the first St. George Anglican Church. So that's kind of an interesting little tidbit. <clears throat> His son, Alexander Vital, served uh, in the militia during the Upper Canada Re uh, Rebellion, was the provincial surveyor for Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, managed banks in Sarnia and Upper Canada, unsuccessfully ran... <laughs> against Alexander Mackenzie uh, in the riding of Lambton, which, of course, was the beginning of his uh, beginnings. He was also the first president of Sarnia's YMCA. And, of course, the famous gentleman himself, Alexander Mackenzie. What can I say? The only thing I think that people don't necessarily always know about Mr. McKenzie was he was actually a stonemason. And the picture um, that depicts the top of his monument uh, is there for the specific reason that he actually created his own family monument. So I thought that was kind of significant. Was he first or second prime minister? He was second. And who was the first? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, and actually, um, yeah, he sort of got into office under interesting circumstances. <laughs> okay, so the gentleman to the, uh, would be your upper right, is actually Hope Fleming McKenzie, uh, Alexander's older brother. He was the city mayor and an MPP. He declined the party nomination, paving the way for Alexander. The gentleman just below him is actually the youngest brother, Charles. He served as MFP. He was also the co-owner of the McKenzie Milne Warehouse. Uh, Hardware. That is the largest family plot that we have at Lakeview, and it actually has approximately uh, 50 uh, members. It's actually over 50 members of the, and we still bury in the family plot. You bury, you stack them up? No, <laughs> um, no. Well, I, uh, I just asked because. Uh, uh, I know uh, uh, a family who lost two a few daughters at different times, uh, and keep them together. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they just put one on top of the other. Was one cremated? I'm not too sure. Quite often, it's one is cremated and put on top of the other. Oh, yeah. Yes, we do do that, oh, yeah. Yeah. but we do we don't stack caskets. Oh, I see. Yeah. It didn't. Okay. A couple times in the old days, if a child died, they would bury the, the child's coffin on top of the adult's mm -hmm. coffin. Yes, so yeah. They did stack them then. Yeah. So, uh, yes, we are. Okay. Um, this gentleman I don't have a picture of, and I really wish I did. Um, he actually is one of the few seamen that was identified following the largest storm on Lake Huron in 1913. And ironically, I think it's, <laughs> I don't know if it was planned or not, he is actually just south of the Mackenzie family plot, which I thought was kind of fitting. There's also five members of um, the sailors group 
that were killed in that storm that are in the cemetery, but unfortunately are in unmarked graves. And they're unknown. They were never identified. So that's kind of sad. Do you know where the Moshe grave sites would be, uh, even though they're not marked? Unfortunately, I don't. Um, we do have records. <clears throat> excuse me. We do have records of um, unknowns. Oh yeah. And we do have locations, but do I know if that's one of the sailors? Oh, no. Oh, 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 but you do. But you. Mm -hmm. your, your unknown plots are very well known. Yes. Plots. Yeah, yeah. You're not going to bury somebody else. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Good question, though. <laughs> okay, so um, George Lees was born in 1830 in Scotland. He followed his in his father's footsteps and became a tailor, immigrated to Canada in 1853 and began with his father, the George Lees and Company leading, leading tailoring and gentlemen's furnishings business. I kind of wanted to do some research on that, but I didn't. The average income for that business was actually 30000 a year. So, wow, you guys like to dress, eh? Oh, ho Unique flat stone, it is actually considered a mausoleum, and it's partially buried. So I'm not too sure. Um, him and his wife are in it, so they may be stacked, actually. I don't know. Yeah, because it's actually not that big. Yeah, it's, it's not very wide. So I'm not sure if they are or not. In that <coughs> case, they might be. <clears throat> this is Timothy uh, Parody. He studied law in Ontario and decided he was going to abandon that to join the California Gold Rush. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yes. After years of nothing, he thought, well, okay, so California didn't work for me. I'll go to Australia to do the same thing. That didn't work for him either. So five years later, he came back quite broke, actually. So he was called to the bar in 1861. He was then appointed crown attorney. In 1867, he gave up the position to run for office. Again, another politician. In 1873, he was named Commissioner of Crowned Land. In 1878, he was introduced as the first forest protection, he introduced, sorry, the first forest protection legislature for the province. And I thought that was kind of interesting. This, I believe, is uh, the son of Timothy. It is Frederick. He was born in Sarnia in 1866. He also studied law at Upper, uh, Upper Canada College and was called to the bar in 1890. He held many different positions, King's, King's Council, Chief Government Whip, which I never did figure out what that was. He also was the Chief opposition government whip. Uh, he was named to the Senate in 1922 and remained there until his death in 1927. <clears throat> in our tour, we have named Anne Telford. Now, she is one of our resident move-ins, and it is just that. In 1879, when the cemetery began, there were, um, the reason the cemetery was opened was to um, collaborate 
one cemetery, they basically took four cemeteries, made it into one. So in our records, we do have what we call move-ins. She was a move-in. I don't know from what cemetery, and I do apologize for that, but I couldn't find those records. The significance of her stone and the significance that we seem to show in our tour, which I'm not too crazy about and don't understand either, is that her stone actually says, with child. I found it quite more interesting that she was married to Froome Telford. Froome and his brother Field were the founders of Froomefield. And I think that's much more interesting. <laughs> However, what do I know? <laughs> they began, uh, they, they purchased um, in 1834. They arrived to a, the small clearing at the St. Clair River, which is now basically LaSalle Line. Together they purchased 12 acres and a log house for $600. And lo and behold, Froomefield began. Built around a small water-powered mill, four streets, Front, Cross, Church, and Richard. Um, that was Froomefield, and I believe it still is. Froomefield, uh, sorry, Froom, <laughs> Froom cleared much black walnut off of 100 acres and would sell it to the freighters going by, and that's how they made their money. Rebellion broke out in 1837, and Froom convinced 100 men to stay and patrol the riverfront between Sarnia and Sombra. <coughs> In doing that, he made many friends. When he decided to move back to England, the Chippewa of Sarnia prepared a huge feast. He was so touched by this that he vowed that every year on his birthday, he would send the provisions for a huge feast. And he did, up until the year of his death in 1902. The last feast was held on November 4th of that year. And I thought that was kind of neat. Yeah. Excuse me, you said there was uh, four cemeteries that combined up to... Mm -hmm. uh, where, would they, where would they have been located? What, they, what were they called? Yeah, they uh, one was a Methodist. Uh, one was... Um, they, they were basically church. Oh, yeah. Uh, church cemeteries. Right. Much smaller. Um, at the time, of course, where Lakeview is now was not in the city. It was <laughs> out in the country. Um, and, yeah, they just they conglomerated them and, and put them all together. There yep. was a church on Christina Street. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Because they were worried about diseases, weren't they? Mm -hmm. yeah. They didn't want the cemetery huh, yeah. close to the city. <laughs> Little did they know. Um, Davis. Davis, okay. Um, J. Frederick Davis was the seventh mayor of Sarnia. He was the county's uh, solicitor. He was the crown attorney and, of course, is known as Davis Street now. My favorite resident, <laughs> Peter Pennington. The scouts always used to laugh at me when I went to his stone. He's my favorite guy in there. He was actually, <laughs> he was actually uh, a former slave and a fisherman. He was trained to fish by his owner, Tuppen Wright, in Maryland. And in 1856, he began his journey to freedom through the Underground Railroad, which of course was uh, a bunch of safe houses that they would travel 
to and fro. When he left, he left with two brothers and a woman, and they headed north, not knowing where they were going or how they would get there. With an $800 price on his head and the driving force behind the Underground Railroad, Harriet Tubman, Tubman it took approximately one month for them to cross the bridge over Niagara River into Canada. By 1871, he was living in Sarnia, working as a fish dealer. In 1884, he died. When he died, he was a very wealthy man, and he left his fortune to four churches in Sarnia. Probably the same four that had the cemeteries. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know which four. That story is actually, it, it's unfortunate that you can, you can just barely see it on his stone now, but it is actually on his stone. Now, because, of course, he was colored, he should have been in a separate cemetery because that's what they did back then. But because we, didn't, we no longer had a separate cemetery, they had to put the word colored on his stone to segregate him. And it is the only one in the cemetery that has that on it. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I understand, like, uh, in the, the States, uh, uh, slavery was big time. It was, uh, in, in Canada, there was slavery, too, for, for some time. You know, we became, we became enlightened, enlightened before the States did. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I'm not too sure how, how soon before... Uh, I, I don't know that. I don't know that answer. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know he was one of the first uh, to actually come into this area that was, that was freed through the Underground Railroad. Yeah. Uh, he passed in 1884. So, the last person on our tour is Norm Perry. I did not know him. Um, uh, I didn't really know of him. Didn't know the significance of Norm Perry Park. I will be honest when I moved in and when I started uh, working at the cemetery. Known as the Galloping Ghost, don't know how many of you knew that, of Canadian football because of his blinding speed and smooth catching hands. In 1934, he led the Imperials to win the Grey Cup over the Regina Rough Riders. At the age of uh, 34, he was the youngest mayor in the city's history and was ex extremely successful at it. In 1963, he was inducted into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. In 1975, he was inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame. He died in 1957. When? He lived on Savoy Street beside my grandma. Oh, is that right? <laughs> His family. Neat. Yeah. Neat. I, it's funny the stories you hear when you get, get talking about things. He was my grandmother's uncle, and he was two years younger than she was. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that happened. Yeah, it, does. it does. It does. It does. Yeah. She was the firstborn. He was the. Uh, no, she was the firstborn of his oldest sister, Perry, mm -hmm. and uh, he was born. My grandmother was born in '02, and he was born in '04. So he's like an uncle, a cousin, or something. I don't know what he is. Give me the uncle. I guess. Give me the details. Okay, so we're on to, these are ones, these are not on the, on the tour. I'm not sure why. Um, I found them kind of interesting. When I got speaking with uh, the gentlemen that actually work at the cemetery, there's a couple there that have been there much longer than I have, and some of the stories that they could tell you. Uh, uh, um, but they had suggested that I include um, these ladies 
So the first uh, one to the left, the upper left, is actually Dr. Um, uh, Schillings. She was a Holocaust survivor. Sorry, Shingles. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, for She spent two years recovering in North Africa Hospital. She became a member of the United Nations Doctors. In 1950, she came to Canada, and she was actually the first female dentist in uh, probably the province, but what I've read is this area. So she's, uh, I, I found her, kind of, her story kind of interesting. And of course, we have... Um, now, I was a little confused by this, and unfortunately, I ran out of time for research. Uh, Honorable Pauline E. McGibbon Mills... She is actually buried under the name of Mills. I believe McGibbon was her uh, maiden name. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry? Well, on her marker, it's Mills. Yeah, so I, I found that kind of interesting. Um, so why the school is named McGibbon, I'm not sure. But anyway, so there you go. I'm sorry? Because of her I, I guess, yeah, yeah. Is she Mills, Mackenzie Mills? The Mackenzie Mills thing, is she committed to I, no, no, it's not spelled the same. So, of course, the one on the bottom left is Pamela Greenaway uh, Kohlmeyer. Um, her death of breast cancer, of course, um, at the age of 38 would, was what led her family to begin uh, what is now known as the Breast Cancer uh, Society of Canada and uh, all the wonderful things that they have, they have done. Um, I added Susan Clark. Now, Susan Clark is not per se there, obviously, uh, but her parents actually are... Um, because she has family in Lakeview Cemetery. So that's why I've, I've added her. Who is Susan Clark? Susan Clark is, uh, she actually played on the show, and I'm going to age myself here, Webster. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So she's just kind of a fun add-on that I put on there. So, yeah, she's an actress. So Scotty isn't buried there off Star Trek? No. I don't think so. No. 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 It's funny because uh, in doing the research for this and the time that I do spend sometimes just kind of gawking around the cemetery, um, you know, our tour is unfair of many other families that are in that cemetery. The beautiful stones, um, it, it's really gorgeous in there just to walk around. And I find it sad that and Sandra and I were, were speaking of this earlier, that in 20 years, I think um, your society in particular is going to run into real problems. And I think in 40 years, it's going to be so minimal, the information that you can find. Why? Because people are not burying their dead. Yeah. They're not marking the lives. And me being an employee of the cemetery, of course, people look at me and they go, yeah, that's just a money grab. No, it's really not. If you stop and think about it, I think it's very sad because the history is not going to be there for people to find. It's not going to be the same. Yeah. And I think... We need to encourage people to, okay, if, you know, your relative wants to be scattered in the lake or whatever the case may be, that's fine. But mark the life somewhere that somebody can find it. Make the connection from the life to the death. And that's... I guess my advice to you guys that are out there um, trying to find the history, encourage it. Uh, years ago, 
um, they used to have busloads of students come into the cemetery and teachers would take them through to get old stones and find this and find that. Now we have college students, one by one, come in for a scavenger hunt. <laughs> and they will come to the office and they'll say, yeah, I'm looking for, uh, I'm looking for a stone that has a cross on it. <laughs> well, look around. <laughs> You'd be amazed what's in cemeteries now. Let me just, you know that we have honestly we have Pokemon that we have to kick people out of the cemetery because they come in droves. It's funny, but it's not. It's really not. So if if a person is cremated, you do the cremation there. We are a crematorium. Do you mm -hmm. have records of that? Or? Absolutely. So there is a record of this person's death somewhere? There's a record of the cremation. Yeah. But that's not public knowledge. But could that's, it be? Um, I honestly, I don't know, to be perfectly honest, because those are, it's, it's government document, okay? Um, we have to have them. But I certainly don't, if somebody walks into the office and says, yeah, can I see the cremation application for so-and-so? Yeah, yeah. Because we have that fine line between the Privacy Act and giving you guys information. I know a lot of you get frustrated when you come in and you'll say, well, you know, can't you just give me the whole list? No, we can't. If you can't give us specifics... If you can't, if you walk in and say, I'm looking for Joe Smith. Well, okay. I've got 15 of them. Which one would you like? Because I can't give you all 15. That's the problem because of that fine line with the Privacy Act. Is it public knowledge because it's on the Internet? Yes. But I'm not giving you that information. There's that line. There's the difference. I think it's the family, the family of that dead person. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a really gray area. It really is. We do our best. Yeah. So if I want information on a specific family that's there, mm -hmm. um, what do I do? What time can I go to find that person? The office is open from 9 to 4.30, Monday to Friday. <laughs> Yeah. You can try the internet. Okay. Yeah, I have. Not much on the corner website at all that information. So other than Google Maps, I don't really know. What kind of information are you looking for? Because if it's not if it's not coming up as an interment record, or if you're only getting an interment record of the location, that's basically all the information we can give you. Unfortunately, um, I've got the same information there at your cemetery as I do at Lake Valley Grove Cemetery along the lake. Mm -hmm. It looks like the exact same family that I moved <coughs> some of the graves into Sarnia. Okay. Um, but you don't, you have like zero for information, zero for age, zero for this. It's just one. If it's a move in, that's all we, <coughs> excuse me. If it's a move-in, that's all we will have. We don't have information on them. Yeah, unfortunately, um, a lot of the move-ins are like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Not a move-in, what information did you have when he was buried? It all depends on the year he was, it all depends on the year he was buried. Yeah. Um, 1905? I could probably, um, I could probably give you the cause of death. Up to a certain year, they would give us the cause of death. They, they gave us everything. Mm -hmm. And, or yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of times, no. What we have as the next of kin is wife. Not helpful. 
frustrating. I know it's it's frustrating for you guys. Yeah, it's, there's no names. Yeah. Is that because it's a private cemetery and not like if we go to Oil Springs, we were allowed to sit at the Oil Springs records and mm -hmm. pull them out of the vault to make lists, and so we could get all when we made our index, we could get all the information we needed and wife and and who whatever we needed. Mm -hmm. But it's because Lakeview is a private cemetery that... It's not private. It's a not-for-profit. But it's the city center who owns it? The internment right holders. We're run See, by... Oil Springs is managed and owned by Oil Springs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We are actually uh, run by a volunteer board of directors. Now, there is a clause in the paperwork somewhere back in 1879 that should there ever come a time that we cannot sustain ourselves as a cemetery, the city must take us over. Yeah. yeah. Can you supply the name of the owner of the, of the block? Uh, generally, yes. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Quite often. And how many plots they bought? Mm -hmm. So if it was 12 or 4. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of times, too, I find when people come in, um, sometimes they'll come in and they'll say, uh, yeah, this person here, you've got it in your records, but you have it as John, and it's not John, it's, it's Joe. I can't just change that. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. We have to go by the original records. So if in our original records it says Joe, I'm afraid that's staying Joe. That's, that's how it has to be, unfortunately. But a lot of people get frustrated with us about that as well. So I do apologize for that, but that's... You're not the one to bury them. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we do. Eighteens, eighteen hundreds. Yeah. Can you offer them like take copies and give them out? Um. Yeah, quite often. Yeah. It has to be a family member, though. How do you prove that? We take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> We do have to take your word for something, right? Like, yeah, come on you, now. You know, like my grandfather has a far different name than what I do, so. Well, I, I don't know. I'd probably say no then. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't, like, you know, especially with women that change the name. Yeah, yeah. We, we take, uh, you know, we have to take people's names for it. Yeah. Um, could you direct them to the funeral parlor that... Did their service or did their stuff with that records be on yours mm -hmm. to help somebody that's running a dead end? I quite often do that. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's amazing the history that you find in cemeteries. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And yet, um, the general manager of the cemetery um, traveled to Europe last year and the biggest thing that she brought back to us in the office was, oh, we have no idea what history is. <laughs> she was standing in a church that was, you know, over a thousand years old. She was standing beside tombstones that were, you know, the same age. And she was just in awe. Yeah, we have no idea what history is. Yeah, we're so new. We're just babies. Yeah. Uh, our youngest, uh, our youngest grade children would be in 1800s, I believe. Mm -hmm. Indiana, 117. Um, I don't believe so, no. Yeah. No. We do have some that are older than 1879. Again, they were moved in. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to say, then, just so you know, the Lampton OGS has... Um, the old funeral homes for some of the ones that have closed in Detroit and Wyoming. Oh, really? That's right. So if somebody's looking for McCain and Whites, or, we have all those records. 
We're having trouble hearing back here. Sorry. I was just telling her we have all the records for the funeral homes that have closed in Petrolia and Oil Springs. So she has somebody come looking because they died in Petrolia and were buried in Lakeview. They, they could phone the Lambton OGS and they have those records. We were given those records. That is good to know, actually. It's very good to know. Um, I have a lot of people that come over uh, from the States that have had family here and, you know, not sure where they're, where they're buried over in the States or here. And, and, yeah, so we do have a lot of requests for, for information. Yeah? Is there, is there um, like, a Catholic versus Protestant? Or? We're non-denominational. Okay. Uh, the cemetery that is across Michigan, mm -hmm. on the north side of Michigan... That is actually Catholic, and it's run by uh, uh, the London Diocese, which is the same one that runs Resurrection. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was, I thought that was, those two cemeteries were together, and it was, there was no Yeah, no, they've always been, always been separate. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just, we let everybody in. <laughs> <laughs> I tell people that, and they kind of look at me funny, but yeah. No, no, it was basically just all quite random. We do have, there's two sections in the cemetery that are the oldest. Mm -hmm. um, section I is the very first. Now, why they started with I, I don't know. But all of our sections, in case you haven't been there, uh, are lettered. The sections are lettered. Uh, the plots are numbered. Now, the plots, are you going to find the numbers? No. You're not. They're in the ground, um, but they are numbered. Um, and when somebody says, okay, they're in, in uh, section I, plot 85, grave number 6, 85, plot 85 has 12 graves in it. Okay, so they're in grave number 5 of that plot. That's, that's what that means, okay? So if, when you're looking online... If it says, in, in a lot of these older records, it says uh, section F, plot 4, north part of the east half. Okay, you've seen that, right? Yeah, and you're going, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, what it is, is get your north and south going, because when you're standing in the plot, it'll be the north part of the east half of that plot. So if you've got 12 graves, it's actually, and that's what that means. That's just like the records. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of them, older plots, uh, back probably 1930s and older, uh, maybe even 1940s, they would buy a plot of land. They'd walk into the cemetery and they'd say, I want 25 feet. <coughs> and that's what they would buy. They wouldn't buy five graves or two graves or they would buy 25 feet by 10 or 25 feet by 12. And then they would try and fit as many people in there as they could. So in the older sections, what you think should be graves isn't necessarily. And they're all willy-wally all over the place. Even we have trouble finding them. So, so. is there a map of the cemetery? Like the yes. There is a full map? Is and there then there are, are pages of maps. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Is yeah. There, there is a, a map of the cemetery, and I probably should have included it in the slides. I'm, I'm, I apologize for that. Uh, there is um, a, a singular map of the cemetery, and then there are maps of each section, okay? So if you go online and you find the person you're looking for, you get the location, write down the information, bring it into me or into any one of us in the office there, we can give you a map 
And we try to sort of pinpoint it as close as we can so that you can find and it. you do a good job because <laughs> several years ago I went in looking for my great-grandfather and you told me about, and I'm sure it was you, was your hair longer? Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, okay, he's in the second or third row. There's a tree right there and a, and a big, and a big uh, um, stone with this name on mm -hmm. I can't remember the name. Yeah. And he's three rows right behind there. <laughs> and my gosh, that's exactly where he was. So was I do try. You that for me too. <laughs> yes, it was, here's the tree, there's this big stuff. Yeah, I do and try. my grandpa I do. Right behind him. <laughs> I feel so bad because there are uh, there are times when you know somebody will come in and, and not necessarily from your group, but somebody will come in and they'll say, "I'm looking for so and so." Okay, and there are certain sections that are worse to to find people in than others. Section A, if you're looking for a child, mm -hmm. we can get you within about six feet. That's you know without getting measuring tapes and and everything else. Um, and section I, it's one of those, you know, they put everybody in every which way. Absolutely. Uh, so when we, <laughs> I, I have actually had people come in and, you know, they're looking for somebody. And I will send them out with the map and, you know, this is what you're looking for. This good to go here, go there. And, you know, okay, first of all, if they're directionally challenged, that's not my fault. <laughs> okay, I do my best. But they come back in three and four times. And it's unfortunate, but I can't always go out with them, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, you've got your sections by letter now. Yes. Previously, they were by Roman numeral. Oh, no. no. That was just the OGS? That's the OGS book. Ah. Yes, it is. Now, the OGS book had them by Roman numeral. I've yeah. converted that. The numbers. They had... The rows drawn in with a starting number and the ending number mm -hmm. of each row. Yep. Would that still be all valid that way? Our stone numbers are right. Okay. I would to think so, books, yes. But not yeah. to her book. All right. So I just have to update the Roman numerals to letters. And that is actually the most up-to-date. Um, excuse me if I'm standing in front of anybody. This is where I meant, okay, the burial database. Okay, if you click on that, and there you have it. It's that easy. Um, so we can punch in Joe Smith and see what comes up. What is it? D E I T H V V V. I get that all the time too. Yeah, I get the V. I, I get the B, and I want the V, right? <laughs> but there's the crew I'm looking for. Well, I can't see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. But She's you only want to talk to the guys. I'll just have to Okay, so if you click, if you, oh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So if you actually so click on one of those names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The information comes up, yeah. okay. So it's section F, plot 85, and it's in the south half. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. One of our older residents. Yeah. But any of the information that's with the other people in that is all zeros. Like if you have family in the back and what they have to do that. that. <coughs> so that's what I was trying to find out if you were trying to get information. It won't go in. Try the L down there. <laughs> go, go figure, right? There's information there. Go figure. It won't go into Barbara, so I'm assuming she's not there. If her name comes up, then it's then she's because that's pulling from our records, right? Okay, so that's age zero. Is it an infant? It quite possibly could be. However. There are times when we have adults in there that, yeah, we have adults in there that we don't know their age. I still get that. Believe it or not, I still get information sheets from funeral homes that don't give me an age. 
So that's that's how it works. I've overstayed my welcome. I'm sorry. No, it's been very good. Yes. In some areas of the cemetery, the tombstones are, are massive. They have to start out really big, they get a little bit smaller, and they go way up high. And on the top is like this urn. Is there any significance to an urn? Um, I think it's a, I think it's a symbol of, um, I think of the times, really. Um, Alexander Mackenzie's has one, quite a large one, actually. Um, I, I'm not really sure what the symbolization is. Um, I can certainly, it's a, it's a good question. Yeah, there's quite a few of them. The older ones, not yeah. today's. No, it's boring. Yeah. It's boring today. Yeah. I don't like them now. <laughs> Let me see who asked that because um, we have a list of that. I don't know if Karen has it here or not, but we got a list from Miles Springs when we were out there and it told what all those things were. So okay. if you email me, I'll try and send it to you. Okay, thank you. I know there w there is one thing that I, I will say concerning that, okay, is a lot of times it is the stonemason. They have a, they're kind of like a jewelry maker. They have a distinct style. We have a bunch of stones in, sem in the cemetery that were all done by the same stonemason, and they all look very similar. They all have, uh, I call it the gingerbread uh, look on the corners and whatnot, um, and it all done by the same gentleman. So maybe that has something to do with it. I'm sorry I've kept you. I, I've been way... Uh, oh. On behalf of the Lampton Branch, we'd like to thank you very much. Oh, you, you, you were very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it went blurry. Okay, thank you. I tend to do that. I go blurry. <laughs>